attorneys need to understand that they must humanize themselves and those that they serve by just understanding them. Sure. My name is Alexander G. Jr. I wear several hats. I'm the pastor of Fountain of Life Church in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm also the CEO and founder of the Nehemiah Center for Urban Leadership Development, a company I started 30 years ago. I'm a podcast host. My podcast is called Black Like Me. And I'm leading an effort for the construction of a new Center for Black Excellence and Culture, $32 million endeavor in Madison, Wisconsin, and I'm its CEO and founder as well. Rather than just going after the heads of the attorneys who are in the room, I wanted to go after their hearts. So I told a story, a very personal and a true story, about um, meeting my family's, um, the descendants of my family's slave owner, and tracing our lineage and looking at how their life played out because of resources and being able to, to hire attorneys and what they thought of when they thought of justice and what it felt like and what the black side of the family thought about having not been exposed to it or having fair access to it. And I felt that by telling the story of understanding why we have such disparities in criminal justice, it might give people the motivation to lean in and say, well, if that's true, how do I then get to meet someone who's different from me? And not just like going on a zoo ride, but really building meaningful cross-cultural relationships. But help, I wanted to encourage them to think differently and to understand and to wear, if you will, the shoes of those who they sometimes defend or support um, in a different light. And I wanted to go after it by telling a story. And it seemed as if it touched the hearts and it, it got things on people's radars. I really believe that it's about relationships. One of the things I, I stated in, in my workshop was that it was a group of people in cahoots and relationships who created these disparities, who created these systems. And so it'll take people who are in relationships to break them and to change them. I give two examples of where um, a, two judges got to know um, black men, one of whom was a defendant in, 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 the federal, in the federal court, but how they built a relationship to understand each other differently. And that has a mutual benefit of humanizing both the lawyer or the judge and the person standing in front of them. Because the judge, the attorney, wants and needs to think like a human being and not just um, someone functioning inside this criminal system or this, this judicial system. And so get to know people. So I talked about how people go out to lunch, they double date, they've really gotten to know each other. And by understanding a different perspective, it made them more sensitive, more intuitive, and more caring concerning the plights of people who are showing up inside their courts. Some, in some ways it's very complicated, but in other ways it's just very simple. That's why we have golf um, memberships, it's why we join fraternities and fraternal organizations, it's why we join religious organizations, because there's something to be said about being in community and being around people who hold similar values and ideals. And if we learn to do that cross-culturally, it will change each person to understand the other better, but these systemic changes begin with relationships and not with policies, in my, in my humble estimation. Yeah. In a place like Wisconsin, um, in fact, I just had a discussion after my workshop um, from a participant who said, you know, I'm still the first, I'm still the only, that for many black professionals, we are still the first and only in whether it's a law office, a court, corporate offices, that carries a, a burden where you're the oddity, um, your novelty and you're representing your whole group, whatever that group um, may be. But then where do you go to, to shake that off? Where do you go to process the microaggressions that that causes? Because that does have psychological and sociological impact on us. It's, it's, it's one, that, that level of stress, those microcosms that successful black people face, it's one of the leading causes for, some of the, for many of the degenerative diseases that we're facing and dying from more quickly than our white counterparts. The center will be a place where we can come and exhale, have community, to have discussions with people who get it. So how's it going in your law firm? How's it going in your engineering company? How's it going in your classroom? So that people can relate. Our kids get to meet each other. Our kids get to see role models. And we get to, to enjoy plays and comics and film festivals and things that we need more regularly than just February. So our story is told. If you think of any major community, there is a theater district. And that's not just for mere entertainment. There's something very transcendent about seeing yourself in the story of your country, your tribe, your people, your group, because it says this too shall pass. We're going to rise out of the ashes. We can overcome this. But if that's not told for black people anywhere and the reinforcement is in the media headlines, it's not in the textbooks unless it's about slavery, 
Where do we go to get that reprieve that our white counterparts get? And if we don't have that, we don't thrive. And if we don't thrive, we get sick. And so the center, and then if we're sick, we can't contribute to the overall economy, community, and well-being. And so the work of the center is to provide place that ultimately enhances black wellness and causes black people to thrive by having a deep, deep sense of self, self-preservation, and um, a sense of resilience. That's not taught in schools. Um, and the center will provide that kind of space. And then we can turn around and create venues and opportunities for our non-black friends and fellow citizens to come into that space and to learn about the great accomplishments of black people, people from Africa, the Caribbean, folks who are Afro-Latino and African-American, our impact on the state of Wisconsin in military, education, law. When others come in and hear those stories through us, um, it humanizes them and us further, and it creates a space where not only we're able to thrive, but we're able to help the rest of the community to feel proud about all of Wisconsin's history. I pastor a very diverse congregation. And so at any given moment, at a, at a wedding, at a funeral, at a hospital visit, I need to understand their context so that I can be relevant in how I care for them. Not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a human being. Attorneys need to understand that they must humanize themselves and those that they serve by just understanding them. When people, see, when, when people feel seen and respected, they respond differently. And so my clarion call to folks here is take steps to humanize yourself by humanizing those that have been disenfranchised by the very legal systems that you're paid to uphold. Understand their plight so that you both become better people.